I'm Jerry Berman, Chair of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and I uh, want to welcome you to our continuing series of distinguished speakers um, who are educating us about all things Internet. That's the role of the Caucus Advisory Committee. We work with the Congressional Internet Caucus. Um, uh, the Chairman of the House side, Representative Goodlad, is on his way, but we want to start the program. This is uh, last week we had Steve Ballmer. Today we have uh, uh, an entertainment giant. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Representative uh, Mike Honda from California, who's the chair of our wireless task force, uh, to say a few words. And I see that Representative Goodlatte is, is coming in. So, Mike, why don't you say a few words first? Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, looks like we've got a bunch of young people here. Everybody's young to me. It's a joke, you guys. You can start laughing. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about today's presentation, and uh, I have the, the, the wonderful privilege of being able to introduce um, our speaker. Uh, in your invitation, uh, we alluded that, uh, that the PlayStation's are not free. No, we didn't allude. We just told you this. PlayStation's not free, but the lunch is. And so uh, we just wanted to reiterate that. And uh, but on the on the serious side, I want to thank uh, Mr. Hirai uh, for being here. Kazuo Hirai, uh, he hails from um, he hails from Foster City, California, via Japan. Uh, I kind of think that he's kind of like third generation Japanese American, even though he was born uh, in Japan. His uh, his whole uh, demeanor is very very American. So. It made me feel comfortable right off. I didn't have to switch to my, my, my motive of talking to my mother, you know, because we all have different ways of uh, behaving with different people. But um, Mr. Hirai is president of Sony Computer Entertainment America. How many of you have PlayStations at home? All right. And it's going to grow, too. Uh, I just called my, uh, my son-in-law. He was in Seattle during Father's Day. I said, how you doing? He says, I'm okay, Dad. I says, well, what are you going to do with your dad? Uh, he says, well, I'm going to uh, be playing uh, some uh, video games with him. And in my mind, I thought they were going to be in the same room. I said, well, your dad's in Oregon. He said, I know. I'm going online. And I thought, oh, i got to get a PlayStation so I can play. And, and so this, this whole arena of convergence of technology is coming to a point where not only it, there's a commercial value to it, but there's also a social value, and the social value is in a society like ours where we're, we're so in tune to traveling and being apart. How do you keep families together? This is, I think, one way. This is another way of keeping friendships together, too, by socializing via the Internet and uh, having video through the Internet. So I think um, Mr. Yudai will probably discuss a lot about that in, in, in the future of the technology that we have before us today. So please. Uh, um, um, make sure that uh, that Kazuo feels at home. And uh, before Mr. Kazuo uh, uh, Hirai speaks, uh, we'd like to have Jerry Berman come up and introduce our our, our next uh, member. Thank you very much. I'd uh, like to uh, call on the, the chairman of the Internet Caucus on the House side, Representative Bob Goodlatte from Virginia, to say a few words, and then we'll get to our speaker. Thank you. I'm going to do exactly that. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for participating in yet another uh, excellent program of the Internet Caucus speaker series, and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Kaz Hirai. He has been uh, with Sony for 20 years, and he is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer of Sony Computer Entertainment America Incorporated. He's responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the company's operations, including licensing, third-party relations, business development, strategic planning, first-party product development, marketing, sales, and network business group. A recognized leader in the interactive entertainment industry, He's played a pivotal role in elevating the video game industry to an important entertainment category that now tops Hollywood box office movie revenues. That's an amazing figure. He joined computer, uh, Sony Computer Entertainment America in August 1995 with responsibility for operational management of the company 
under the former president. Before that, he worked in Sony Music Japan's New York office, coordinating the marketing of Sony Music Japan artists in the U.S., and he began his career with CBS Sony Incorporated, now Sony Music Entertainment Japan, in April 1984, where he was instrumental in marketing coordination of international music in Japan and later headed the International Business Affairs Development. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Kaz Harai. Thank you very much uh, for, that, uh, for that great introduction. Uh, just listening to uh, all the things that were uh, on, my, uh, on my introductory remark there, I'm uh, glad that I have a lot of people working for me, doing all, that, the, all those things for me. Uh, first of all, uh, now I'm getting really nervous because usually, in, in, my, in my position, I do a lot of uh, speaking, you know, whether it, uh, you know, it's uh, industry conventions or just speaking to employees or various meetings. But uh, in my industry, where I come from, Usually, uh, the attire for the day is a polo shirt and a uh, pair of jeans. Um, and if you're wearing a black pair of jeans, then uh, you're really dressing up. And khakis, my God, what's going on? So the only time I actually wear something like this is uh, if I'm actually interviewing for a job. Um, and uh, when I usually speak, therefore, a lot of the people that are listening also do not have ties or coats. So to see so many ties in one room is, uh, is just blinding to me. So. Uh, you guys are freaking me out. So that, that's where I stand right now as far as the audience goes. So anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for uh, the opportunity. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking to a group of uh, distinguished people. And uh, today I'd like to talk about the development and evolution of uh, online video game console um, uh, over the past several years. Uh, and uh, it's really its impact on the uh, interactive entertainment industry as a whole. But before I get into that main topic of discussion, I wanted to briefly uh, touch base and talk about uh, our industry, the video game industry, or what I like to refer to as the interactive entertainment industry, uh, and also talk a bit about uh, my company, Sony Computer Entertainment America, and also uh, the PlayStation business, and then talk uh, about uh, our efforts and our accomplishments thus far of taking the PlayStation 2 consumers into the online space. And hopefully we'll have time for uh, some questions and answers as well. So first, uh, to talk about the size of the US interactive entertainment industry, the retail side um, of the video game industry, the interactive entertainment industry, in 2000 was about $10 billion, $7 billion of which was generated from software, the, the other remaining $3 million from hardware mostly consoles, some peripheral accessories, uh, but the majority of the revenue that's generated in this industry comes from the software side. $10 billion, just to put it in perspective, among the other entertainment industries, uh, rivals that of the box office receipts of the motion picture industry, uh, and over the past several years, we've been neck and neck. They've uh, come out ahead on, on several years. We've come out ahead uh, on other years, but it's about the same size um, as the box office receipts of the motion picture industry. Um, it's also become common knowledge, I hope, uh, that the interactive entertainment industry or interactive entertainment has really become a part of America's uh, mainstream entertainment option. So today we have interactive entertainment, we also have uh, movies, whether it's at the theaters or uh, at home watching DVDs or videos, and we also have music. So in my mind, there are three main pillars of entertainment, and certainly video games, interactive entertainment has become a solid third pillar of consumers' entertainment options. Uh, just to give you some metrics on the industry, uh, consider that half of all the Americans aged six and older actually play computer and video games. The average age of a gamer today is not uh, you know, eight years old, it's not in the teens, but in fact it's 29 years old, 39% of which are women. And 85% of all games that are released today uh, in the American market are rated either E for everyone or T for teens. 
Um, so there seems to be a misconception that, uh, you know, video games are, are for kids, maybe preteen, um, perhaps high-end uh, teenagers with a lot of violent games. But in fact, as I said, a uh, 29-year-old is the average age with 85% of the games being uh, rated E for everyone or T for teen. And really, as a uh, testament to the sustainability of this industry or this entertainment option, uh, on a survey that the, uh, the industry conducted, the Entertainment Software Association, ESA, more than half the gamers that we surveyed expect to be playing just as much or more in 10 years' time. So the uh, people that are playing today, you know, as they grow older, so the 29-year-old average gamer today, when they turn 39, they're going to be spending just as much time or even more time playing interactive entertainment. Now, just uh, talking briefly about uh, Sony Computer Entertainment America. Sony Computer Entertainment was established back in 1993 in Japan uh, as a joint venture company, and this gets confusing, I know, between Sony Corp, the hardware electronics company that sells the VCRs and the DVDs and all these other good things, and Sony Music Japan, which is a record company uh, subsidiary of Sony Corp. So it was a joint venture between the hardware part of Sony and the software uh, recording industry part of Sony. And uh, this was the first company within the Sony group of companies where people from the hardware side and the software side got together to create an entirely new business. And to this day, Sony Computer Entertainment remains the only Sony company in I don't know how many companies in the Sony group that deals in both hardware and software under the same roof. Uh, in the United States, Sony Computer Entertainment America was formed in 1994. We currently employ more than 1,100 uh, people, uh, mostly situated in Foster City um, and in our San Diego studios. But we have employees uh, situated in literally all 50 states where we have field merchandisers that go into retail to uh, make sure that our presence at store level is done the proper way. We also have sales offices uh, across the United States also uh, software development studios uh, across the U.S. Uh, in Utah, Oregon, Illinois, uh, Texas, New York, Massachusetts, and also a sales office in Minnesota. So we're very spread out uh, throughout uh, the United States, uh, but our main office is in Foster City, which is in California, which is uh, about 20 miles south of, uh, of San Francisco. The original PlayStation uh, was launched in Japan in 1994 and in 1995 in the United States. Uh, and also in Europe subsequent to that and other parts of the world. And 10 years later, it's still on the market today. And it recently surpassed the 100 millionth mark uh, just several months ago. Um, and you, in, just in the United States, we have about 37 and a half million original PlayStations uh, in the consumer's hands. So if you do the math, it's uh, basically more than uh, one out of three households in the United States having a, uh, an original PlayStation. Uh, the follow-up to the PlayStation, uh, what we call uh, the PlayStation 2, was launched in Japan in 1999 and 2000 here in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe. Um, and today we have uh, more than 70 million PlayStation 2 units in the consumer's hands across the, across the world. And in the United States, uh, we have uh, close to 30 million units uh, here in uh, the United States. And interestingly enough, the original PlayStation, it took it 10 years to reach the 100 million mark. Um, but in short, in five short years with the PlayStation 2, we've already reached 70 million worldwide. So it's a testament to how quickly the consumers have embraced the console, embraced the technology, but more importantly, embraced the entertainment value that the PlayStation 2 brings to uh, the users. Uh, and in line with uh, the demographics of the industry that I talked about, uh, today, more than 63% of the U.S. PlayStation 2 users are over the age of 18. Uh, again, reiterating the fact that uh, for the PlayStation 2, it has become really a part of uh, America's entertainment, mainstream entertainment option, as opposed to being a toy uh, just for the kids' market. Uh, also, uh, just wanted to briefly touch upon uh, and share with you information on the fact that the United States uh, is the biggest and most vibrant uh, market for inter interactive entertainment software. Uh, obviously, the major uh, markets would be the United States, Japan, and, uh, and Europe. 
But with the PlayStation 2, just to give you some metrics, on the hardware side, uh, the United States market accounts for 42% of all the PlayStation 2 units that are in the hands of the consumers. And with software, it's actually higher at 46%. Uh, so if you do the math, uh, obviously, if you have three major territories, 33% would be the, the norm. But in fact, the United States uh, is a, a bigger market as compared to Europe and or surprisingly uh, Japan as well. Uh, today, a lot of the Japanese software publishers that uh, create games for the PlayStation or Xbox or GameCube, uh, they primarily look at the U.S. market and ask themselves what would be uh, appealing in terms of gameplay features for the U.S. market first and foremost uh, before they consider what the Japanese consumers will accept. Five, ten years ago, it would have been the opposite. They look at the Japanese market to see how many they can sell there, and if they can export it and bring it to the U.S. or to Europe, great. But uh, the tide has really changed over the past five years or so, where now, again, the Japanese publishers even look to the U.S. market really to uh, guide them in their product development uh, initiatives. Also, as we all know, uh, the, one of the, uh, the, the biggest, not one of, the biggest uh, software publishing company, uh, independent of the console manufacturers, Electronic Arts, or EA as we like to call them, um, is uh, the biggest software company uh, in the world, and th they're obviously based uh, here in the United States in Redwood Shores in California. Um, and it's also, uh, Doug uh, Lowenstein from the ESA pointed this out to me uh, this morning, uh, EA happens to be the fourth largest uh, capitalized software company in the world behind companies like Microsoft and, uh, and Oracle. So uh, again, a uh, testament to the growth and the size as well as the stability of the interactive entertainment industry. So with that background, I uh, wanted to get into the main topic of discussion today, uh, online games. Um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of numbers and metrics and all those good things, but uh, the most important takeaway um, that I would like to get across to everyone in this room today is that interactive entertainment in the online space is already big and it has the potential to become even bigger as the years go on and broadband adoption here in the United States grows further. Also, when I refer to online gaming, I'm specifically talking about playing games online uh, with your uh, console as opposed to uh, online gambling, which sometimes is also referred to as online gaming. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, when I refer to online games, I'm talking about playing games, not, uh, not placing bets, uh, you know, with, uh, with other people. Um, even before uh, the advent of, uh, of video games in the mid-70s, uh, you know, when we said games, uh, it, you know, whether we're referring to board games, card games, or playing cards, what have you, games always had two important aspects. One is entertainment, the entertainment value in playing games, and the other is the social interaction aspect of games. And uh, you know, with the advent of video games, that uh, obviously got carried forward as well with the original Pong, where you had entertainment value as well as social interaction by playing uh, with, your, uh, with your friends or members of your family uh, in the living room, for example. Uh, and, and there's really no question that the advent of it, the Internet um, has fundamentally changed uh, and expanded exponentially these two important aspects of, of, uh, of video gaming, um, the entertainment aspect and the social aspect. Um, whereas before, as I said before, whether you were playing Pong or some PlayStation 1 game, you were basically playing with your friends in the living room. But now with online games, we're able to expand that social experience, the entertainment experience across town, across uh, you know, states, uh, and literally across the world uh, when you're interacting with uh, fellow players from other countries, uh, which some of our games are already able to do. Uh, also, uh, before going further, I wanted to mention that uh, most of my discussions will be centered on uh, console gaming as opposed to uh, online gaming on the PC. Now, a lot of people may think that the two are very similar, but in fact, in my mind, uh, they're very different. Um, and I'll just point out some of the differences that, that I see. Uh, what I first referred to as the 40 degrees of separation between PC gaming and, and console gaming. 
the PC is basically, first and foremost, a productivity tool. And so most of the time, when you're in front of a PC, whether you're playing games or uh, you know, working on your Excel spreadsheet or PowerPoint presentation, you're basically leaning 20 degrees forward to do whatever it is you're doing on the keyboard. With a video game console, you're basically leaning back on your couch at least 20 degrees. Uh, while you're playing the game. So there's basically about a 40 degree of, of, of separation between the PC and, uh, and the console. Uh, and uh, in, in more, uh, you know, practical, in, in a more practical sense, uh, the video game console is usually in the living room where, again, uh, you know, you, most of the families will have at least one TV, hopefully. Uh, and that's where the family gathers. That's where the interaction, the social interaction with your family members and friends happen. Most PCs that I know of usually do not reside in a room that is meant for social interaction. It's usually in the home office or in the den somewhere. Um, with a 17-inch screen, perhaps, maybe a 20-inch screen at best, whereas most households today, I think, have a TV that's at least 27 inches. So the console space, or where the console is, with the TV in the family room, is where uh, the two important things, entertainment and social interaction, happen. Whereas with the PC, you may get some entertainment value, but there's really no social interaction the way video game consoles provide uh, that kind of interaction. So there's always been some talk about uh, you know the convergence of PCs and console gaming, but in my mind, the two are completely separate and will continue to be uh, separate uh, with really no convergence. I really do not see um, a huge spike or a, uh, a, a breaking out, if you will, of the market for gaming on the PC um, for exactly the reasons that I stated, whereas the console, again, is specifically designed for entertainment. So I, I continue to believe that uh, those two will keep separate um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so with the, uh, with the PlayStation 2, getting back to online, we launched a, uh, a $40 accessory called the, the network adapter for the PlayStation 2 back in August of 2002, uh, which gave the consumers uh, the ability who had PlayStation 2s to take their PlayStation 2 experience into the online environment, whether through broadband or through analog. And today, uh, we've been able to uh, expand the install base of the network adapter to about 10% of the 30 million consumers that have PS2s. So in effect, we have about 3 million uh, PlayStation 2s in the United States today that is ready to go online. Uh, and this isn't a market, and 10% may seem high or low depending on you know, where your standards are, but this isn't a market where traditionally add-on accessories, and I'm sure you gamers know this, um, do not sell very well except for perhaps an extra controller or a memory card. Other accessories for consoles do not sell well, so a 10% install base of anything except a controller or a memory card is actually a phenomenal number. Uh, I mentioned the U.S. leadership position um, in terms of the industry as a, in, in general, but with the PlayStation 2 network adapter, the U.S. market actually has a whopping 78% of the entire worldwide install base of uh, network-ready PlayStation 2s. One would assume, uh, one would uh, think that uh, Japan, uh, with uh, you know its uh, very aggressive push, or in South Korea with its aggressive push for broadband, would have a higher penetration. But in fact, uh, again, the United States accounts for 78% of the network adapters um, for the PlayStation 2. Talk about some online metrics um, for the PlayStation 2. Um, today, we have on average about 2,300 new users coming onto the PlayStation 2 online service every day. So we're talking about 60,000 users, new users coming on every month. So we're basically bringing in a whole football stadium uh, worth of people onto the PlayStation 2 every month uh, just for online. On average, there are about 200,000 users uh, that are playing uh, on any given day. Obviously, higher on the weekends, lower during the weekday, hopefully. Uh, and uh, they're playing one or two games, uh, or many games, but uh, you know, depend, depending on the day of the week, but averaging 200,000 users uh, a day. And taking, for example, uh, more specifically, uh, SOCOM, which is one of our uh, military strategy games. This is a game that has sold more than a million units as a software in the United States. 
36% of those users have gone online to play this game at least once. And 8% of the entire install base of a million people, so about 80,000, um, are playing this particular game on any given day. So again, the numbers may be small compared to the 30 million PlayStation 2 users we have in the North American market, but I believe that it is a very aggressive uh, number of people that are playing um, with a, and embracing a new technology. Um, and you have to remember, this is the first time they're going online. They may have been playing video games for a long time, since 75, but this is the first time we're giving them the option of going online. So we believe that this is a very uh, good number of people that are uh, going online. In terms of uh, who's going online uh, and how they're going online, as I said before, the network adapter has both analog and uh, broadband connectivity. Uh, the latest data shows that about uh, a third of the, of the users that come online with the PlayStation 2 are still doing so through analog. Uh, now, we expected that uh, percentage to come down, but in fact, it's really stayed stable at about 30% um, to 35%, depending on how you uh, segment the data. Uh, and we believe that uh, this is uh, partly because, as you know, the console price has come down. We started the PlayStation 2 at $299, now we're $149, so it's become more of a mass market proposition. Um, and as the product becomes more mass market, you're going to have less and less people that have taken broadband into their homes and signed up for that service. So between the two uh, metrics there, uh, the affordability of the pricing of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the console and also just the increase in the network adapter um, keeps basically the analog uh, connectivity percentage at about a third uh, and constant. 93% of the people that play online today on the PlayStation 2 are, uh, are male. Um, and uh, the age is uh, the, between 18 and 34 uh, is the highest demographic uh, average and they play about 24 hours per week, not per day, uh, online. Now, I wish they would play 24 hours a day, but uh, that's for a different time. So why do they play online? It's basically the same reason why people go on the internet. Um, it's a sense of uh, purpose um, to accomplish something online. It's a sense of belonging to a community of like-minded people. In this particular instance, uh, hanging out with other people that love to play SOCOM or Gran Turismo, whatever the game may be. Um, they're basically information exchange uh, between uh, their peers um, and sharing their experiences online uh, with, uh, with other people. Uh, so that's the kind of metric that uh, we've been able to establish in just uh, two short years since the launch of the network adapter for the PlayStation 2. Um, but, uh, and so we're very, we're very happy with the, with the progress and the success that we've had thus far on the PlayStation 2. But the biggest challenge is obviously looking at uh, this uh, install base of users uh, and saying, okay, so where's the business model? How is everybody going to make money uh, on this uh, online space, uh, whether it's the console manufacturers or people who provide the software for uh, the consoles, uh, companies like EA. Now, one research indicated that uh, by 2006, so in two years' time, uh, online games will account for about $500 million in revenue, um, but uh, the, the jury is still out on how much revenue can really be generated uh, from the console space, especially in this generation of, of hardware. But the important thing in my mind is the fact that with 10% of the install base on the PlayStation 2 already online, it's really important for us uh, as the uh, technology providers and also as software providers to understand what works in the online environment, what resonates with the consumer, what kind of issues do we have on the back-end infrastructure? What do we need to do on the, uh, on the customer support side of things? Um, and these are all things uh, that are very important because in several years, whether it's PlayStation 3 or the next generation of Xbox or the new console from, from Nintendo, one thing is absolutely sure. Online is going to be like air conditioning in a car. Uh, it's going to be like air. You're going to need it. You're going to have it. Um, and it's not a nice to have, it's not going to be an add-on accessory like the network adapter is for the PlayStation 2. Um, so saying to ourselves, okay, we have the technology now in PlayStation 3 to do this, 
how do we actually interact with the consumers? And asking ourselves that question then is certainly too late. So we need to start proactively understanding what the consumer wants and what the consumer is expecting of us and what works, what doesn't work today so that we are prepared to present uh, even a better experience online as the next generation of consoles uh, come into the market. Uh, Let's see. Uh, oh, yes. Um, and uh, just a, another metric for you. Uh, the, I, I've been saying online games. Um, and uh, again, right now, because of the fact that there is no revenue generation per se um, for online play uh, on the PlayStation 2, most of the software that's available for the PlayStation 2 are what we call online enabled as opposed to being an online exclusive game. And what that, that, what that means is that the games that are uh, available for play that can go online basically starts out with a great offline game. So 80% of the game you can enjoy without going online. The rest of the 20% or the social interaction, if you want to go online, is there for you as well. So it's really a hybrid as opposed to a game that's got to be played online and there's no other way of playing. And the reason why we started out this way is because game development um, is a very expensive and a very high risk, uh, high return uh, business. Games can cost for the PlayStation 2 upwards of $15 million for the initial development. And that's just on the development without getting into the marketing and other things we do to try to sell the product. Uh, so it's very difficult in this environment today where you only have 3 million people uh, on the PlayStation 2 that can go online to spend $15 million to come out with a game that can only be played online. So what we've done, and most of the other publishers that publish on the PlayStation 2 have done, is to create a great offline game um, that can be played without going online, but with the added incentive of going online if you want to. Uh, and that's been a very successful model for us in terms of making sure that we get a higher return on that $50 million uh, initial investment. Um, also, uh, you know, we try to amortize that $50 million investment by making sure that we have a solid engine. That's the basis for a lot of the uh, gameplay. Uh, so it's almost like an engine of a car. We make sure we have a solid engine when we first develop the game so that if the game is successful after we spend $10, $15 million for the first iteration of the game, we're able to launch, uh, for example, uh, SOCOM 2 or SOCOM 3, which are sequels, which will take advantage of the original robust engine that we've developed and uh, also try to uh, make sure that we are able to amortize the initial $15 million investment with a lower investment for the sequels. And when you look at it in a five-year term or five-year long-term uh, perspective with three, four titles, that you're better able to amortize uh, those, uh, those costs of, uh, of development. Uh, also, uh, so to, in addition to the software development of, uh, of, of uh, about $15 million, give or take, uh, depending on the size of the game, We've also made some heavy investments on the infrastructure side to support the online games as well. We've hired about 40 additional people to support the infrastructure as well as uh, include the online capabilities for our games. Um, and uh, so the initial investments have been very high, both in terms of software development as well as uh, the infrastructure costs as well. And. Uh, I'll talk about you know, the other business models uh, that we have uh, in, uh, in our plans to try to amortize that and be, make the online games more of a revenue generator as opposed to a nice to have free to play. Uh, but before I get into that, I just also wanted to talk about some of the fundamental shifts that we've seen in our own business uh, as we take the consumers online. Five years ago, or even four years ago, three years ago, if we take a PlayStation 2 consumer, we sold, them a, we sold them a PlayStation 2 console, they went out and bought a PlayStation 2 game. They may call our consumer line asking for uh, tips, or when is the next sequel coming, or I can't clear this particular level, or how do I get this new car in Gran Turismo. We'll help them out and send them along their merry way. With online, uh, things have fundamentally changed in that these consumers are online 24-7 and they want instantaneous feedback and help if they find a glitch, whether it's their online connectivity, whether it's gameplay. Um, so you have a lot more frequency of contact with these consumers um, as opposed to the one-off question and then sending them on their merry way. Uh, it's, a, it's a great marketing tool for us as well as 
uh, it could be a great pitfall for us because we have that internet and frequent uh, contact with those consumers. So if you try or if, you, if you're not, uh, if your consumer service is not up to standards in terms of making sure that the consumer is happy with that interaction, then you're going to have a very unhappy customer. And, you know, gamers, especially when they're online, they're exchanging information all the time with their peers. So if you have bad uh, CRM, consumer relation management, then people are going to know about it very quickly and your brand as well as your trust that the consumers have built up on on the PlayStation brand is going to go down very quickly. So we've had to also beef up a lot of the consumer uh, relations, consumer service side of things as well as our infrastructure to make sure that those consumer interactions are, uh, are of the highest quality and the consumers go back happy. So getting back to uh, this question of how are we going to generate some revenue uh, in this space. As I said, the majority of the games today, um, the, the software are on, on, online enabled. Uh, the software is able to go online. The user is able to go online uh, and play for free without any subscription fees. Uh, but we need to make sure that we start generating revenue uh, in this space. Uh, the, the most simple uh, way that we looked at uh, the space is to say, well, you know, just like anything else, what about a subscription model? Uh, what about asking the consumers to pay $9.99, $12.99, $14.99, whatever, for the uh, privilege of coming online and experiencing the online gameplay? And we'll add more features um, so that you know they uh, get a big bang for their buck. We've looked at that model. We've studied it very carefully. Uh, but in my mind, in our minds at SCA, we believe that it's at this point in time very difficult to ask the consumers to pay a recurring subscription fee on a monthly basis for a service that they really do not understand um, what the benefits are or what they will be able to get in return um, on a monthly basis. Uh, cable subscriptions, uh, AOL, uh, even Netflix, um, those subscriptions work because the consumers know for the monthly subscription fee that they pay, they know what they're getting. Uh, you know that you have five channels of HBO, three channels of Showtime, etc. Uh, when you pay uh, your cable subscription, you know that you're going to get uh, you know hundreds and thousands of movies that you can rent uh, with Netflix. That's why you're comfortable in paying you know the monthly subscription fee. With online gaming, what am I going to get? Um, and I think uh, that is going to be a challenge for us if we were to go down the uh, road of a monthly subscription fee. So we've looked around. Uh, we've considered a variety of different models, and at this point in time, we believe that the biggest uh, and, and best way to generate revenue um, is looking at the iTunes model uh, that Apple has, uh, has successfully implemented uh, here in the United States. I know they just launched in Europe as well, um, and that is what we call microtransactions. Rather than asking the consumers to sign up for a monthly subscription of music downloads, what they've done is uh, every time you download, you pay 99 cents. Uh, and that seems to resonate very well with the consumers, and we believe that that is the kind of approach that will resonate with the gamers as well, where if you have, for example, a game like Gran Turismo, you can go online, and if you want to download uh, three new cars, a uh, new set of tires, new suspensions, a uh, new engine, a new track, that will be uh, 99 cents, 59 cents, three dollars, uh, depending on, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, items you're downloading. Uh, but you're paying for something tangible that has immediate gratification. Um, and uh, we're working very hard right now to develop a system uh, where we were able to offer that sort of microtransaction uh, payment and uh, downloading of uh, additional levels and products to the consumer's PlayStation 2 uh, for, uh, for basically refreshing the content of the software that they've already purchased. Uh, just to do some quick math, uh, Gran Turismo again, taking that driving game, for example, which has sold 5 million copies just in the United States alone, uh, I said 10% penetration for online. Let's assume with the next generation systems, we have 30% of the consumers that buy uh, the system going online. So that's about 1.5 million consumers. Um, and if they're downloading, say, uh, $5 worth of cars, tracks, um, accessories, what have you, that's $7.5 million uh, per month. Um, so that's about $90 million uh, just on Gran Turismo alone. Uh, revenue in the United States. Uh, when you consider the fact that even today, 25% of uh, the 220 games that we publish on the PlayStation 2 are online enabled or have the ability to go online, 
there you have a, a great opportunity to start really generating some meaningful revenue um, for certainly the console providers, the technology providers, as well as the makers of the software as well. Uh, so that's where uh, we believe the revenue generation is going to happen. And uh, again, as I said before, that's where I think uh, the consumers will uh, understand and embrace the, uh, the, the fact that you're being asked to pay for something that's very tangible as opposed to a monthly recurring uh, kind of a subscription fee. Uh, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about very briefly is uh, this idea of uh, broadband and uh, you know everybody's talking about how broadband um, is starting to really uh, take off not just here in the United States but across the uh, the world especially in countries like South Korea where I believe they have 70 percent penetration uh, in the old days with the with the video game console business um, it was very uh, much enclosed it was very much vertical in that all you needed to do was again put out a console put out the game um, and that was it. You didn't have to rely on other industries to help you out uh, because most everybody had TVs uh, and most houses had electricity, so that was it. Today, when you go online, uh, you need the help of other industries to make your initiative work. Um, so we need to have a higher penetration of broadband, and obviously the broadband penetration hopefully will become higher with more compelling entertainment content as well. So the two will feed off of each other, but the growth of broadband and affordable broadband service, I believe, is a must, really, for us to continuously uh, grow the online space with the PlayStation 2 or any other console, for that matter. Uh, because, as I said before, more than 30% of the users online with the PlayStation 2 today are doing it through analog. Uh, now, in Japan, the number of people playing online are very small on the PlayStation 2, but we don't even offer a network adapter that has analog capability. It's all broadband. Now, in Japan, it's very different in that uh, the analog phone lines, you're still paying 10 yen for every two and a half, three minutes of phone time, so it's very difficult for people to play online games. You pay for three hours, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg, whereas broadband is, uh, is a flat one-rate fee. So that's one of the reasons why broadband has taken off so well in Japan. But nonetheless, the plain fact of the matter is they have higher broadband penetration. And the gamers um, are experiencing broadband and only broadband, um, so very quick uh, interaction, very uh, intense game th play through broadband. Whereas in the United States, we have, uh, again, 30% of the user base that are playing games through analog, which is, uh, you know, which is well and good for very low uh, network requirement games, like downloading a lot of stats. But if you're talking about playing one-on-one, -on -one, um, or even uh, with multiple players on a football game, playing on analog could be a bit of a challenge. So one of the things that we're looking for in terms of growing our business is um, having the, uh, the cable companies and also the phone companies uh, up their broadband penetration from the 30% that I believe is currently in the United States, and that's got to be at, a, at an affordable price. Um, I believe, uh, you know, after the promotional period ends, uh, broadband is still $30, $40, $50. $40. A PlayStation 2 game is $40. So uh, for us, it's like asking the consumers to purchase a PlayStation game, uh, PlayStation 2 game every month, which is not a bad thing. But again, you know, that, that PlayStation 2 game is content. The, the $40 you're paying for broadband is basically just a pipe, uh, the access fee um, to play content. You're not getting content from the broadband providers except for, you know, Yahoo pages and what have you, but it's not compelling entertainment. Um, so that's one of the challenges that we face, um, and certainly we're going to hold up our end of the bargain to make sure that we bring compelling entertainment content that's going to have the consumers say, hey, I've got to get broadband. My friends are playing uh, X, Y, and Z, Gran Turismo 4, what have you, online, broadband. I got to get this at home as well um, and, uh, and try to increase the penetration that way. But we also need help from the other end um, to make sure that the broadband rates come down, make it more affordable for the consumers to embrace. Uh, and this is true really for other parts of uh, the technology as well as we embrace uh, you know, and push the envelope forward on technology with uh, you know, next generation software and hardware. We could have, uh, for example, uh, you know, HD TV output for our games. But unless we have the cooperation of TV manufacturers, hopefully like Sony, um, come out with HD TVs that are affordable, we can have the output, but there's no output device. So again, we're dependent on other 
uh, industries to help us grow that install base, to help us grow the business um, to, uh, to a larger uh, you know, uh, percentage of the overall entertainment landscape. Um, and we need the help of other businesses. Lastly, in closing, uh, as broadband grows, as broadband uh, becomes, uh, the penetration becomes higher, it becomes increasingly important to make sure that we are in the forefront of, of protecting our copyrights uh, on the software side as well as technologies that we put into the hardware. Uh, for the PlayStation 2, uh, we have taken a proactive initiative uh, from our end to create a, uh, a proprietary system called uh, the DNAS, Dynamic Network Authentication System, that basically has a server, a bunch of servers in Japan. And what it does is every time a PlayStation 2 user goes online, it matches the PlayStation 2 ID number to the software ID number. And all it's doing right now is making sure that it's a legitimate PS2 with a legitimate uh, uh, software copy um, to make sure that, again, we're, consumers aren't playing uh, pirated copies. But that's the first step in making sure, especially as consumers go online, that we are protecting our copyrights and IPs. And uh, with the advent of broadband, with the, the quick transfer speeds of, uh, of any software, uh, that's going to become increasingly important to make sure that we are able to uh, make the necessary investments both in the hardware as well as in the software with the revenue and the profits we generate um, from sales today to, again, continue pushing the envelope to grow the industry. Um, and, uh, again, that's going to become more and more important um, as broadband penetration becomes higher and consumers are able to transfer data from uh, one place to another uh, in a very high-speed environment. Uh, and that's going to be a key issue for us as we try to grow this business further. Um, I think I've spoken long enough. Uh, so if, uh, you know, I'm going to end here. Um, I know it's been a very general overview um, of, uh, of the PlayStation 2 online initiative. But again, as I said uh, at the beginning, this business is already big. Um, it, we're, it's, still, it's big, but we're still in its infant stages. Um, but it's a necessary step that we need to take so that we understand what the consumer needs, what the consumer wants, so that as the next generation of soft, uh, hardware systems come out, we are good and ready to make sure that we provide the best compelling entertainment experience to all the consumers. So with that, um, I'm going to end my uh, presentation. So uh, open up for uh, questions. Yes, and if Mr. Hai, if we could ask folks to ask questions from this microphone and the one over there so everybody can hear, with the exception of Congressman Goodlatte and Honda, of course, who can ask a question from where they like. <laughs> uh, yes, thank, <clears throat> thank you. I have a question. Mike Ross from Senator Burns' office. Um, can you, you talked a little bit about the future of video games. Can you make specific reference to advances in holography and AI and kind of project out in like 5, 10, 15 years down the line and talk about kind of extraordinarily compelling experiences and how you see that developing uh, with specific reference to, again, to AI and holography? Uh, with regard to holography, um, I think the biggest issue there is going to be, again, uh, back to what I was talking about, um, the output device. Uh, if we are able, or if the electronics manufacturers are able to, for example, have uh, output devices, uh, affordable output devices that can work with holography uh, and 3D imaging that way, uh, certainly we will be there to support that. But unless that output device is affordable, um, I really do not see holography as being an integral part of any future gaming uh, at this point in time. Ever? Um, I won't say ever, but again, um, unless the output device becomes an affordable output device, like the television is, for example, um, it, won't, it won't have the opportunity to become a mass market proposition. Is Sony doing active R&D work then with reference to holography at all or no? Me, I'm is, Sony doing, is Sony doing active R&D work then, or, or is this something that's just not on the... Um, we're, we're, it's not necessarily holography, but we are doing a lot of R&D, not just in uh, you know, 3D uh, expressions on a 2D surface, but also a uh, you know, variety of input devices to the console, for example. Uh, a great example would be something that we call the iToy camera, which allows you to play games without having to you know, uh, touch a controller. Uh, we actually put that to market. So a lot of different things are going on, whether it's the input device into the machine or the output device. Uh, and that would include, uh, you know, again, 3D rendering, um, not necessarily holography uh, per se. 
Um, AI uh, obviously has, uh, you know, has always been an integral part of video game uh, software, um, and it obviously it gets better uh, as the generations go, uh, you know, into more and more uh, sophisticated uh, technologies, uh, and that's something that we're consistently pushing the envelope on. Um, and uh, you know, for example, with the uh, for you gamers out there, um, for example, with Gran Turismo, uh, our uh, driving simulation game, uh, depending on how you interact with the other cars that you're racing against. If you're aggressive, they're going to get aggressive. If you're not as aggressive and you're not trying to, you know, bump the guys, they'll be, uh, you know, a bit more forgiving as to, uh, you know, how it lets you pass. Uh, those things are always coming into play. And also a lot of strategy and simulation games, the, I, the AI technology that we've incorporated into those are, uh, are very complex even today. And they will get more complex as the years go on. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Irene Wu. I'm with the Federal Communications Commission. I had a question. I'm sure you can make um, games and applications for any speed of broadband service, but I wondered if you, if you could describe the difference between, um, for policymakers like us, right, what the difference is between a, an application that can run on 500 kilobits per second versus 1 megabit versus 5 megabits or 10 megabits. Uh, that really depends on the benchmark where the software developers uh, want to uh, uh, want to place on on the bandwidth. Uh, what I mean by that is they need to balance between the entertainment experience and value, um, and what kind of bandwidth is required. You can have a game that requires 10 megabytes. The only problem is you're not going to have too many consumers. Um, that are going to be able to do that. If you have something that runs on three or two, you're going to have more consumers. But the trade-off there is you may not be able to engage, uh, you know, ten other uh, players, for example. So it's a balancing act that they need to go through, looking at the kind of software that they're developing. Uh, you know, is it very intensive in terms of team-based play, or is it mostly one-on-one? -on -one? Is it mostly downloading stats to update, uh, you know, your your players or your car? Um, those are the things that kind of go into play. So there's really not one standard that we use in terms of saying it's got to be X number of megabytes. It's that trade-off that we look at. Okay, thanks. Hi, Chan Liu with the Senate Commerce Committee. I recently read in the Wall Street Journal that uh, Department of Defense has contracted with uh, one of your rival competitors to develop uh, a simulation software for, to be used by the soldiers in training. Um, and I also remember seeing a uh, special on ESPN how NASCAR drivers are using the NASCAR game t as a training tool for their upcoming races. Can you comment on the future of the use of gaming consoles as a simulation for uh, training and as a training tool? Um, I think that, uh, at least in my mind, uh, it, it's, it's very flattering that a lot of the, uh, you know, NASCAR drivers or, you know, other uh, football players, for example, are playing, uh, you know, video games to maybe, uh, you know, keep their senses, uh, you know, in tune um, for their upcoming race or what have you. Um, I do, however, fundamentally think that if you're talking specifically for real world training purposes, uh, you know, video games are first and foremost about entertainment. Um, and therefore, the games um, really, um, I don't think, are necessarily applicable 100% to real-world training of police officers or for, uh, you know, for the military, for example. Um, I think that you know it's it's a it's a nice way of keeping in tune. But um, you know, if you're talking about simulation software, my mind is that you need to develop something specific for that purpose, as opposed to asking our police officers or soldiers to, you know, to play video games to, to train. So I think the two are completely separate. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank much. you.